Okay, hello everyone. So we have with us today, Lindsay Smith, uh, Assistant Director of Innovation, Tech and Innovation Department, Central Bucks School District, woo! Okay, <laughs> and then Adam McGraw, Director of Instructional Technology, Conestoga Valley School District, yay, woo! Okay, and then Michael Stein, CTE Innovation Systems Coordinator, Berks Career and Technology Center. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you do your beauty queen wave? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And then Dr. James Peterson, Superintendent, Essex County Schools of Technology. Yay, okay, mm -hmm. good. We've had a really good conversation today. So let's have some more. I wanna just ask the first question. What is your, what is your thing that you're most enthusiastic about in schools right now? So let's start with you. Um, for us right now is the opportunities that we're seeing with some of the things that are changing with the technology that's being introduced um, and bringing that to bear inside of the classroom for the students and seeing where they're going to be able to take some of that. So this is really the beginning of that induction of the artificial intelligence age, if you will, in education. Good. All right. And uh, Dr. Peterson. So uh, I run a vocational school district in New Jersey. So there's technology through everything. Even even our cosmetology program has technology involved and in what you would look like in this kind of hairdo. Or, or uh, and uh, so we have that embedded throughout everything. Uh, we have um, simulators for excavators. So I like all of that technology being infused in all the different uh, all the different uh, fields that we have as well as drones and um, having our kids use AI to program computers. So we've always had computer programming, but now we're having AI help them code as well. So staying on the forefront um, of technology in the industries is really, really important. And also having a good advisory board to keep us abreast of what's happening out there is really important. Um, in our K-12 institution, uh, as an educator myself in the technology and innovation department, one of the things I love to talk about is interoperability of tools. So mm -hmm. helping to make sure that our curriculum department is very informed on what tools will work in our environment. So we use ClassLink and we like to make sure that there's like single sign-on and ensuring now that like that data visualization piece is there so we can make really informed decisions about what kids do need in that MTSS process and just that really I geek out on that and making sure that everyone understands what that means. Um, it's hard work, but our team is doing a nice job of getting in there and talking to teachers and administrators and just informing our whole crew that our fiscal responsibility is in making sure that we pick the right products so that it's working optimally in our, all of our classrooms. Yeah, kind of yeah. like Kelly was talking about. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so Adam. Um, I think the uh, zooming out a little bit in the district I'm in, and just uh, I recently switched jobs from uh, one to another this summer, so it's interesting to see the differences that they bring. Um, but the commonality I'm seeing is uh, the concept of adjacent possible work. When something changes, uh, what other possibilities are there? And I think it's a very creative time. I see teachers coming up with a lot of different ideas. Both districts I was with have very strong foundation, education, innovation foundations that are supporting a lot of uh, creative works that the teachers are doing. That's great. All right, so um, a lot of things we could talk about, but we talked about the future and being prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Where is your attention right now to be prepared for the future? And I want to start with you first. Mm -hmm. Come back around. It's great. So, Definitely, once again, we're, I'm a vocational district, so we're really about careers in college, right? And making sure that every student has a plan after high school. So being relevant and trying to get our students uh, prepared for the workforce while simultaneously taking care of all the state mandates is really hard. So we try to do stuff where we release the kids uh, in senior year so they could actually get that real experience. Yeah. And what we're finding is most young people today don't have those jobs like we used to have. So those soft skills that were taught outside of school, now we have to teach those, those skills as well. So they're not having those jobs. I mean, when I was a kid, I was late to work every day. Uh, and now I'm the superintendent. I'm one of the first people in, in school. So I had to learn those lessons. But, uh, and you have to fail sometimes. And in, in school, we don't want, you know, failure is a terrible thing where you're not supposed to say it. But we actually grow from that. So trying to get our, our students prepared for 
all the things that happen after high school is really important. And that's what we've been focusing on. And, um, and just making sure that they're successful and getting, we talked about this this morning, preparing them for the world that we don't know really is going to, that is going to exist. Yes. Lindsay. Yeah, and on the topic of AI, we spent a lot of time today talking about that. But one of the things that our department, Jason Jeff, he's our director, and he's leading this with our team, but is really staying ahead of the conversations with AI, recognizing that there's a spectrum of where people fall, from students to parents to administrators to teachers, and some people know nothing, some people embrace it, some people are restricting it altogether. So just allowing those conversations to happen and facilitate professional development while also staying ahead of it and learning ourselves, because we're no... We're no experts, but we are a couple steps ahead of people, and we're trying to make sure that with a handbook and in celebrating the use of it with teachers and making sure, like, yes, you're doing this, we support you, but you know, also making sure that we have those guardrails like we talked about today in place and hopefully getting that board approval and that stakeholder approval so that we can, like we were just saying, make sure our students are ready for that because that is their future. It's not, not going away. Yes. Yeah. Uh, every day we're really focused on with our team is in, uh, in, as the director of instructional technology in our department. How can we make within these systems everyone's lives better? Um, and I think AI has a lot of opportunities to reduce some of the uh, monotony and bring back some of the humanity into the work that we're doing. And uh, I'm really excited about diving into that with our district. Uh, basically two focus areas and one you know, just touched on, which is basically that professional development and bringing all of our stakeholders under the same roof with understanding how to use the AI in our center. Um, but also the other focus that we are trying to focus on is how we can use AI to go through and understand the data points that we have to help guide our decision making. Some of the things that we really prided ourselves on is being able to use data to understand where our center needs to be going and what we need to be doing in the future. But now with this added ability with AI to be able to layer these different data points over top of each other and make better distinct decisions on where the direction of our school can go is going to be very important. We're looking forward to it. I like it. All right, so we talked a lot also today about the challenges that we're seeing, right? Like what's really going down out there. And I like your opinion of what it means, if you feel like you're comfortable saying that. I'm going to give you five seconds to come up with where what you're going to do with your answer, and then I'm going to call on one of you. Five, four, three, two, one, Adam. What what means? <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, right? Um, what, what, what's happening with the sea change of absenteeism and mm. the attrition and the homeschooling and the vouchers and the not enough teachers, you know, the big screeching problems? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, it's your opinion of what it means. I, I think I think it can be overwhelming, and I think the biggest thing is, is it is also an area for growth and to affect positive change. And each day just trying to do that and being cognizant of those larger uh, uh, trends that you highlighted to us and what are we doing about it each day without having an uh, analysis paralysis as well. We have to act, yeah. we have to take a step and make 1% improvement each day. It will change the trajectory and that's, that's what I try to, to, to focus on. So absorbing the things that you're talking about and then when I'm making a decision, how can that be future focused uh, recognizing that data and then actually doing having a plan towards uh, solving for that. Uh, for us at our career center, just like uh, with his, well, what we have found is actually we're not falling into a lot of those trends at this point. We actually saw a resurgence in some things because of a couple of factors, and I would consider that. Uh, coming out of COVID and then being different from the regular academics, having a different kind of cultural buy-in to the subject matter that we have because of being a career center, draws that attendance. We have a really good attendance uh, rate and uh, wanting to be at our school. And a lot of the things that we receive on feedback from the students that participate in our school is how much happier that they were because they came to us as opposed to what they were doing in their traditional school setting. And I. Give a lot of kudos to that to the 
faculty and the people that work there. Um, but we need to be able to learn to or see how we're going to be able to maintain that and keep that up there, especially things when it comes to uh, driving marketplace trends where we're struggling to find replacement teachers as well because of the amount people now make out in industry versus what it is we will be able to offer them in the classroom as a uh, salary range and other things to try and keep them there. So if we don't have the salary, what we need to do is find other ways to make their jobs easier. And some of that comes into that technology realm to be able to streamline the things that they have to build when it comes to all the things of managing students, developing curriculum and doing what they do in the classroom on a daily basis. Wow, okay, good. All right, so Jane. I'm gonna go in a different direction and look at the more social aspect of it because I see what happens, what's happening in our country is playing out at a school level. And every school could look different. Um, and I enjoy all my students, but I do see that they have a tough time reconciling how their adult role models in the country handle problems and how we expect them to handle it at the school level. And in most cases, my students act much better than many of the leaders that we have. And that's all across the board. And I think, but I see students struggling with what's happening on socially, with social matters, with a variety of different things and trying to figure out where they are in, in this world, also realizing that, um, that adults don't know everything. And if anything, that the, you know, we've pulled the curtain aside now, and some of us are going to admit it and some of us won't. We don't know what we're doing. We're trying our best to lead with an uncertain future, uncertain present sometimes, and the kids are on to it. And I think maybe we need to just embrace that, and instead of it being this hierarchy that we're older, we know better, maybe we need to partner with them because I hear so many other things from students. Um, a student just, just last week told me he, he was rejected in the program and he says, he tells me, rejection means redirection. And I never heard that before. I've been around for a while. Mm -hmm. And now I'm quoting this kid who's 15 years old. So <laughs> maybe we could do a little bit more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think to go off of that makes you think, and when I was hearing a lot of your facts today, Lani, I was thinking, as educators, we almost need to do what we do with our students is like stop and have ourselves like reflect on like, why is this data saying this? And does everyone even know that this is the data? So really facilitating as district leaders those conversations, but it really took me today, the, uh, the idea of is no longer just like us in our districts. Like we have to have these conversations more broadly and like especially in a state like Pennsylvania, really come together and approach this systematically on, we don't want this anymore and how can we go about this together? Because in school districts, I, I think we forget that, yes, students are coming to us because they're paying taxes, but like you're showing in your data, people are choosing to not come. And there's a reason for that. We need to figure out what is it we are servicing. We are in the service industry. And this is, we don't want it to be a business model, but we have to market ourselves as a business and say this is what we stand for and really take a more business approach to it because that is what brings people in the community that comfort, like they know what they're doing and kind of take education back and say, you know what, no, we are the experts here and this is what we know is is good for kids. And if that means we have to shift a little bit, I think that's a good thing, but I don't, I don't know that shift's going to happen fast enough for some families, but I do think that that means that we have to, we need to look in and figure out what we're doing. Yeah. Oh, you did that. I responded. He was number was one. Oh, that's right. You guys yeah. got to keep track yeah. of it. Do you want to change your answer? <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we, need a, we, need this, we need the talking stick and we have a pass. Yes, you have to have a talking stick. <laughs> well, I, the only other thing I want to ask you really is, you know, what was your opinion of what you found out today? Right, like there was a lot of different parts. We talked about the personalization flexibility. We talked about flex learning logistics, which is a wild new LA or, or AI. I'm sorry, um, alpha generation, the traits, and we talked about the nines of AI and human intelligence. And we talked about workflow logic. So, you guys, I'm going to have you go first this time. Okay. Which was which was like sort of like okay, I got something like you know what happened with you. Well, I've been following this for a really long time. Specifically, it wasn't even no story when you were talking about it, but that Uberization of learning has always been something that really really excites me. Um, 
So I think it's, I'm excited for the modernization of teaching and learning by also combining what I mentioned before, like the uh, interoperability of technology, getting our tools to work for us so that ultimately we're doing what's best for kids. Like I think that if we keep coming back to what's best for students, there are a generation of students that don't know any better. This is their life, but we need to come to them where they're at. We can't expect them to come where we're at. And if that's where they, they are, what are we as their supporting adult structure doing to allow them to be the best members of society as they move into the world? With that, we are serving, we're servants to them. And so if that's where they are, we can't change that. That is their reality. So I'm very excited to kind of use those tools, use our knowledge, come together as adults and really support our students because they're the ones, I think, in years that will be supporting us, right? So we have to <laughs> make this work. We hope. <laughs> we hope yeah. there. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, for me, it's hearing how everyone's navigating AI. Uh, specifically, each district has a, you know, a charge, and I think um, we are an important voice, at least in our role, we're being looked to, uh, to, to help facilitate that. And for us, uh, having a large conversation with, with all stakeholders is really important, including parents. Um, because it's such a fundamental shift in, in where we're going and uh, being able to hear from others on how they're um, using these, this research, how they might be reflecting on this, the different approaches and varying approaches was really refreshing for me. Good, good. Well, is there a role that you would think could exist in educational districts, organizations, that becomes like the AI liaison, or is it really gonna be an all hands on deck, everybody's getting in on it? I think it's everybody, but let's hear what they have to say, because Michael, I think you'd be a really good one to answer that. Like, is there is there a role of evolving? Um, I was actually at a conference yesterday <laughs> and talked about my role and what I do now, because my position has shifted. I was in the classroom for about 13 years, and then I was a, a instructional technology coach for about seven in the last two years now. They moved me out of the one-on-one -on -one in the classroom embedded kind of uh, role of training to now look at how we can take some of the tools and actually implement them in the school and create these. So when you reference that, that's really now what I've become, but it's not just exclusively to AI because I would look at other things right. and deal with other things with technology and things that could be improved. Um, so I do see there is a growth moment for that need in a school, whether that is an internal person who already may be well suited for that or something that comes from it. Because during even the conversation I had yesterday, a board member that was in the audience came up to me and said, I need to understand how we might be able to create something like this in our environment, in our school, because they did not have one through the things that I was talking about then. So um, hopefully that's kind that's of exactly addresses what, what your about. concern yeah. is. Um, to go back to your original uh, yeah. questions here for the group, uh, what I'm taking away from today was everything that we're still talking about is we have to come back to, even though we're talking about artificial intelligence and all these technologies and everything else, is what is it that is fundamentally changing is the technology, but it's still focusing on the students. And mm -hmm. if we continue mm -hmm. to focus on that, that's what's going to enable us to make the right decisions and choices to grow this. And there's a lot of change that's being discussed about infrastructure and modalities and uh, methodologies and all these different things. But in the end, focusing on what the students are going to need is going to be able to keep this educational process ultimately fixing all the problems for the number one person in the room, and that is that student. Yeah. yeah. So there were just two parts. The one for AI, I realized that we don't have the time like we had before. I remember when computers were being taught in the schools and they were being taught by typewriting teachers initially. Uh -huh. And they focused on where you put your fingers for the keys itself and how many years we lost. But I think it was a different time then. We don't have that time now. Uh, we can't have the luxury of waiting until all of our uh, you know, teachers retire before we can now in, in, introduce AI. That has to be done right away. Um, and we're already behind, so we have to kind of catch up with AI and make sure that we make it as a, you know, a tool and keep uh, students in the center. The other thing was the, the, the scheduling. I'm a former high school uh, scheduler. I had scheduled 1,800 kids when I was vice principal. 
Uh, I did my dissertation on calendars and a couple of books on calendars and year-round calendars and four-day school weeks and stuff. So that really interested me. And the only thing I would add, I think the, the idea was really, is really where we need to be. The only thing I would add is, is I'm thinking from a different lens of like how, uh, whenever I had a schedule, how everyone would tell me it's not going to work. I think you need a fidelity specialist. Mm. which is someone who's just going to make sure that when they say they're going to do it, they do it. Because that's really what, what, what happens where it goes awry is when you have everything done and then you have people that just don't pick up their pieces. And if everybody, because that's an integral, you know, very, uh, it's not, it's complex and it's not, but if not everyone's doing their piece, it could all fall apart. So quality control. Quality control. Saying, yeah. I said fidelity because you really want to believe it. Not only just quality, <laughs> like you got to believe in that mission. Yeah. Yeah, this is really a time. I'm really glad you said that. My only caveat would be that's a relic of the manufacturing age we should have already had. When you when you manufacture in a process, you have to have quality control. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with humans, is there another element there, James? Yeah, yeah. Interest, <clears throat> their intelligence. Status quo. Yeah. That's probably the major thing. Is is that I don't know what that looks like. I know what this looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. but project yourself based on everything we said today into that future where. Our focus is exactly what Michael was just saying. It's entirely on the individual. Throw out everything. What is your? What do you see? What do you see? If we could do it a different way, what do you see? Something like that, where it's, it's more student. We, we talk about individualized learning experiences and choices, and this is what kids want today, too. I mean, we all want choices. We want to choose. Even if there's not much choice, you want the illusion of choice. Yes. Because you feel empowered. <laughs> And then also to, I mean, we're in this, we, we've been in, in a deficit kind of matrix where we, we look at all the things that kids can't do and we, we give them all of these things to just keep them in that track. I mean, think about how many special ed kids are staying in that track when they don't need to be. And there is nothing really done with kids who are advanced. And I don't, you don't even have to be smart. You just need to have, you know, be self-disciplined. We do a dual credit program where we have an associate's degree and you get your high school degree at the same time in one of my buildings. And it's not always about if you're a straight A student, it's can you handle that workload? So you could be a B student and knock out an A student, but just because you're, you know, you can handle more and you're able to have time management and things like that. Other skills, yeah. Hey, Lindsay, what do you think about the same question? Like, what do you see? What's going to happen? I see. I, I think like kids with the choice. Choice. I just keep going back to choice for students, but that means that parents need to allow that kid to make the choice. So I think that choice is a very utopian word, but I think it requires all adults to be on board for that. Because if I really want my student to have choice, they're going to make choices that I don't necessarily agree with, and I have to be supportive of that if I really want choice. Right. So. I think choice is a, a great word when we throw it out in education, but I don't know that people, when it comes time to execute that, really give kids the choice. Well, if it's not informed, yeah, it's not a choice. Right. And kids are not informed on everything, but some of them are way more informed than the adults in the room. Like James was saying, right? So maybe they are making the better choices. I like what you're saying because I think you're right. Like we throw that around a lot. Yeah. But at the end, like we have three choice periods and we have this, but we're, <clears throat> I mean, Really, at the end of the day, like the kid's making a choice for just like, how do you want to spend your free time? Like, do you want to run around? Do you want to talk with friends? Do you want to get help? We know that we want them to get the help. They're not picking the help. So we're disappointed that they're not choosing to get the help when we carve out time for them to get the help, you know? So I think that that's where we, we're struggling with the word choice. But I, what I see is that kids really do have choice and it's informed choice and it's leading them down a help, happier, healthier future. We hope, yes. We hope. Yes. yes. We hope they're making good choices. <laughs> I think the uh, the anxiety, the unknown, is is fear inducing, but it's also a really great opportunity uh, for growth and and, and and actual fundamental change in, in what we're trying to accomplish. And again, coming back to students, 
uh, and what our purpose is and our mission. And I think it could allow for a lot of clarity around that. And I know that um, I would like my own kids to have those experiences of being able to get what they need when they need it. I would sign them up for that. I'd sign myself up for that when I think about when I'm working on a project or something else. And that's the kind of experience I want to contribute to. Uh, uh, as far as how it takes shape, I think it's going to be like everything in humankind. It's going to be messy. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be fraught with uh, a lot of different things and just navigating that part. And I would rather be uh, working in the system on trying to, to, to do that than from outside. Mm-hmm. Good. Michael, your wrap up batter. Well, I was going to say is I want to weave into both of what you had just said in regards to choice and, and that, but I find that to be. In, kind of why I think we've had some success in our center is that it's they have that choice Mm -hmm. and that choice then also provides them empowerment to Mm -hmm. actually want to do what they're doing because it's what they're interested in and that empowerment and that interest is what gives them that intrinsic motivation to want to be successful and do what they're doing as opposed to being told you must do this now and it's nothing they have interest in so it kind of gives them that energy and that you know motion moving forward and wanting to get into an experiment and try something even if they will fail at it but it was now under their own guidance and idea that they wouldn't have that failure that learning moment i like what you just said and i'm going to give you one little it's going to be a speed answer and then we're going to go to audience questions (laughs) i think what you just said is key to the future and that is the right to fail Mm -hmm. is as much a right as the right to succeed The right to fail teaches us something, but we have not, as a nation, allowed you to fail. We're not allowed to fail. You're supposed to be a winner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, and there's something wrong with that. I'm just saying, I think it's almost been a flaw in the design. And people don't like to admit it, but we are failing kids forward every day of the week. The right to fail has to be recovered. So wrap up, final thoughts. You already said your part. James, your part. I, I think maybe we should just all go back to the why. Why are we doing this? What, are, what, is, what is the outcome? I mean, originally in our country, it was for them to become better citizens or, or, or to be literate. What are we doing now? And I don't know if we have one answer. I mean, there's a bunch of answers that we have. And I wonder how well we're doing all of them. I mean, you know, you no, can't. Not. Yeah. So I think we have to go back and maybe look at either as a country or even as a district, what, what is the purpose? What are we doing here? Because I think we're trying to, we're trying to do too much for everyone. And that's okay, I mean, it's a bold, I mean, that's what we do as educators, right? We always take on more. We never say no, but I think we have to refocus. What is it that we really, what is our mission? And maybe that can um, really then guide us to the future. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I, everything, AI, all the technology, I come back to the human focus. Like, how do we bring the human back into this? And there's no technology that's going to replace what we're doing here, which is conversation and being empathetic and thinking with our hearts and our heads. And I think that that's what we just have to have these conversations with people outside of this room, you know, bring this back and just allow people and, and hear perspective, but keep bringing facts to the table, right? Like just giving them your information and just we are the humans and I just think that we have to keep embracing technology while keeping control of, of what we can do better than any technology. I think a lot about the progress principle as uh, some Harvard professor talked about the the idea that uh, when they study all of these different industries and how people um, are able to feel successful the number one thing is, did you progress and make progress in something you're doing? And I think that a lot of the things we talked about uh, were people that just feel like they're spinning their wheels. And I'm hoping that some of these technologies will allow us to feel like we're having some more progress and, and making meaningful impact. All right. Okay. So I'm going to walk on camera for everybody to know. Let's give them all a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Everybody. Thank you for being here. We're going to still let them ask you questions and grill you. I have to turn it off. Thank you very much. Okay.